242 folks joining us. Thank you all for, for logging in today. Um, welcome to our next collection stewardship panel called Less Than Ideal But All Too Real Challenges in Collections Management. Um, just a couple logistical things for you all today. Um, this is a Zoom webinar and versus a meeting. So you are seeing all the panelists, but we cannot see or hear you. Um, you'll notice at the bottom of your screen that there is a Q&A feature. If you have any questions that come up during the presentation, go ahead and enter any questions in there. And feel free to use the chat box to say hi and welcome to all of your colleagues joining us today. Um, the webinar is being recorded and we will share that out um, after the presentation on the CSAM website as well as our listserv, so keep an eye out for that. If you have any trouble with Zoom, please feel free to visit the support right here or email me at caitlin at .org. I'll try to keep an eye on my email as well or you can always um, put something in the chat box. I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Caitlin Potis and I'm the secretary elect of CSAM. Um, I'm also the registrar at Mingay International Museum in San Diego. Thank you again for joining us today. Um, we are going to be hearing from a couple of panelists. First, we have Corinne Midget. She's the registrar at the High Point Museum in High Point, North Carolina. We also have Melanie Deer, collection manager of anthropology at the Arizona Museum of Natural History in Mesa, Arizona. Chelsea Morris, the registrar at the Casemate Museum at Fort Monroe Authority in Hampton, Virginia. And Caitlin Sharp, the registrar at the Colorado Springs Pioneer Museum in Colorado Springs, Colorado. So without further ado, I will send it over to Kareen to get us started. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, I know we're all Excited to be here today. Um, thank you very much to CSAAM for giving us the opportunity to present our session. Um, <clears throat> I know we were all disappointed that we weren't able to do this in San Francisco, um, but this is great because we're able to reach a lot more people and um, it's free also. So thanks to CSAAM for offering that. Um, before we get started, I also wanna thank Tiffany Charles at the Field Museum for um, kind of starting the idea of this session and um, bringing the four of us together. Uh, it was really her, her idea, her impetus, and um, she kind of got it all, <clears throat> all started. Um, today we're gonna talk about some difficult situations that we have dealt with as um, registrars or collections managers. And um, mostly what we wanna talk about is how we responded to those situations and how those situations affected us um, professionally and personally, and hopefully give you some um, tips or ideas for how to deal with some of those situations yourself. And we'll do this um, as a panel, so we'll take turns answering questions um, going around in the group. And then hopefully we'll have some time for questions at the end of that, so uh, it's a lot to do in about an hour, um, but hopefully we'll, we'll get through all of it. Um, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Corinne Midget. I'm the registrar at the High Point Museum in High Point, North Carolina, which um, High, High Point is um, in the triad, so near Greensboro, Winston-Salem, <coughs> north of Charlotte, um, and we are a local history museum, so we have a little bit of everything that you would expect to see in a museum. Um, and I'll let my fellow presenters um, introduce themselves as we kind of go around and answer the first question, I think. Um, I also wanted to say, I don't know if, um, or I don't want to speak for my fellow presenters, but if there are any questions that we don't get to answer, you're welcome to email me afterwards. Um, my email is easy to find online. I'm the only Corinne Midget out there. So um, with that said, I'll go ahead and um, start with our first question, 
which is just um, to describe what this less than ideal situation is that you went through. And we'll start with Melanie. Hello, I'm Melanie Deer. I am the Anthropology Collections Manager at the Arizona Museum of Natural History. Um, I've been in this position for about two years or so. Um, I was a contractor before that, so I kind of did a lot um, in the collections before that. Um, so our less than ideal situation goes back actually way before my time. Um, we inherited a historic building from the federal government that had been abandoned for several years and there was plans to renovate it that fell through so it remained mostly abandoned um, but I had some predecessors that felt it was a good idea to store archaeological material in said abandoned building um, which just on a short um, explanation, we've run into dead cats, which also use some piles of dirt as litter boxes. Um, we have electrical hazards down there, and we're planning on doing air quality tests. And um, since we're not in person, you can't see this, but I am currently pregnant. And so the way I announced to my supervisor that I was pregnant was that I said, I can't go into the federal building. And she actually understood what that meant. So... <laughs> That was always kind of fun. Um, but one of the biggest things that happened in my time was um, last September, we also had some break-ins where a homeless man with schizophrenia began to build a gym in there for fellow homeless people, including a boxing ring, which you can see here, that um, we have all now lovingly dubbed Hobo Fight Club. Um, I had to include the pictures because most people don't believe me when I say this happened, but yes, it happened. Um, thankfully, those bones that you see scattered around the edge are all fake because a few months later we found real human remains down in the storage in the basement. So if he had found those, he could have easily done that, which would have been extremely bad. Um, so I'll, later on in some of the later questions, I'll go into how this turned into a slight plus. <laughs> But yes, so we have had break-ins and a man decided to build a Hobo Fight Club gym in our storage facility. Thanks, Melanie. Uh, I think our next one um, is Chelsea. Hey everyone, um, I'm Chelsea. I'm the registrar at the Casement Museum out at Fort Monroe. And I have a special guest that is uh, my partner in crime, Minerva. Hopefully she doesn't cause too much trouble, but um, everyone loves seeing their animals on these Zoom calls anyway, so I'm not going to kick her out just yet. <laughs> so I work at the Fort Monroe Authority, which is in Tidewater, Virginia. So right in the, um, let me get my geography right the southeast corner of Virginia, so pretty close to um, Norfolk and Virginia Beach. So we are right on the water, and as you can see, this is our institution here. I've kind of um, highlighted just the museum part in that red box that you guys are able to see. So unlike Melanie, we don't have off-site storage. All our storage is on-site, and again, that red box is where our museum is located. So we have a bit of a different set of challenges in that our structure was a, originally used as a military installation. So you're looking at a 200 year old stone masonry fort, um, clearly never intended to be used as a museum. So as you can see, we are actually surrounded on all sides by a tidal moat, uh, which poses some interesting challenges. Again, being right on the Chesapeake Bay, um, it's not uncommon for us to have issues like hurricanes and water infiltration. So having a moat surround us is a bit of an, a unique situation that I'd never seen at any other institution. And so when I came here, um, that was a bit of a learning curve for me. And then also, if you can see, we have kind of, we like to tout it as our green roof, um, but you are able to walk across the top of the roof of the entire museum and walk the entire perimeter of that stone fortification. So instead of having a traditional roof, you know, with mechanical ductwork and things like that, we have six feet of earth that people can walk around. Um, and also to 
you know, just make our site even more unique. There's a pet cemetery buried on there. So around the entire perimeter, there's 300 plus pet graves from military families. Um, we even have a few military working dogs buried up there. So we've got our museum surrounded by water. Then we've got our vaulted ceiling roof. Then we've got about six feet of earth and then um, some remains buried on top of that. And then people walking on top of that. So our issue is the structure itself and how to deal with working in a structure that was never intended to be seen as a museum. Um, so if we go on to the next slide, we can actually see a little bit of what our collection storage looks like. So um, you can see that barrel vaulted ceiling that we have in all of our spaces. And that's actually very similar to how the gallery looks as well. We have um, all these barrel vaulted ceilings throughout every chamber of the gallery space as well. So we'll get into a little bit more about the collection storage and, and we'll come back to this issue um, and this particular image as we go on through the presentation. But um, just in terms of, of some of the, the challenges um, that we face here at our institution, I hope we can kind of grasp that we're all in some unique situations with our institutions. All right, Caitlin's next up. Okay, um, so I'm Caitlin Sharp and I'm the registrar at the Colorado Springs Pioneers Museum. Um, the museum itself is actually in a historic 1903 courthouse, um, which is really fantastic, but does limit our storage capacity. Um, we obviously can't have things that are really heavy um, and only have so much space. So to solve this problem in the 1990, our foundation bought a old warehouse. Um, it's actually two warehouses that were actually joined together. The original warehouse is from 1956 with a prefab metal building attached to it from the 1970s. Um, and the combination of the two, there's all sorts of problems that um, the staff since the 90, 1990 have really been working through. Um, there's obviously no HVAC system. Um, there's only really weird um, kind of ceiling mounted heat units that really don't do that much. Um, and only a few of them work. Um, there's a lot of entrances and exits, um, including giant six, six giant 14, inch, 14 feet steel rolling doors that are really heavy and also don't have a really good seal on them. Um, as a result, obviously, we've had lots of issues with dust. Um, we are in Colorado, so it is a very dusty state. Um, pests kind of getting in because there's not really a good seal on the building. Um, we have had a lot of issues with the roof, um, and we'll kind of talk a little bit more of that um, kind of in some of the main challenges, um, as it was actually a roof um, kind of roof leaks and massive roof leaves that has finally really led to change um, in the building and kind of getting more motivation and support. Um, but we do still have these ongoing issues. Um, we also, because we are in a downtown area, there is um, a kind of transient population that we also always have to be aware of in terms of safety and security. Um, so it's really a whole bunch of um, kind of issues that you'll hear us all similarly talk about. Um, Roofing, um, good seal to the building, no HVAC systems, so not really any sort of environmental controls. Um, but with this, we have been making a lot of steady improvements over the past few years, um, including sealing up the building, um, adding security film, um, new sprinkler heads. Um, we actually did put some compact shelving in recently, and we're actually at the point right now where our HVAC system, which is kind of one of our last major um, repairs um, that needs to needs to be dealt with um, will be fixed in the next few years because we did receive an NEH Sustaining Cultural Heritage Grant. Um, so my museum's kind of at the point where we um, really worked with this building that we are happy to have because it's close to downtown, it's easily accessible to the museum, but we're kind of just working through all these fixes to make it ideal for museum collections and kind of the work that's been done um, both by myself but also by other staff. Um, I'm still kind of new at the museum. I've only been here for um, a little bit over two and a half, two and a half years. Um, but it's definitely been a, a really great learning process um, trying to make our offsite storage work. All right, so lastly, um, my issue stems from summer of 2017 when we had a six week period when our air conditioning went out in our collection storage room, which you see in the picture. Um, North Carolina in July and August is not when you want to have your air conditioning go out. Um, we 
long story short, we, we did what we could, but <clears throat> we still had a mold issue. Um, you can see the mobile storage units in the back of this building or back of the room. Um, the mold tended to, it looked like it um, kind of started at the very back of those units. There's a wall behind them a below grade wall and it started at the back of that, at the center of the mobile units. And you could see based on what it affected that it kind of traveled along the floor and then worked its way up the shelving. Um, in that area, we had um, hanging garments and we had um, a lot of wooden items, wooden furniture. And uh, the mold really liked a lot of those materials. Um, so, our, our main issue starting out was that uh, me and then our curator, Mary Nanabinet, we had to figure out how we were, one, going to clean <clears throat> hundreds of items, uh, and then also make sure that this wasn't going to happen again because um, the HVAC system in this portion of the building, a lot of the parts date to 1971. Um, it's all been kind of cobbled together and <clears throat> fixed here and there over the years. And um, it's, it's just not in great shape. And it's not going to be replaced anytime soon uh, <clears throat> by our um, city government, which is what our museum um, falls under. So we had a lot of challenges going forward. Uh, so our second question, we'll move on to that, is um, what challenges have you faced in responding to the situation? And now everybody knows what order we're going to go in, so I won't chime in and tell you who to go to next. Um, so I surprisingly have found that convincing people that a location that isn't safe for people isn't safe for collections has been a challenge. Um, I didn't think that would be a problem, but it is. Um, I mentioned how the break-ins end up being kind of beneficial. Um, I didn't mention before, but we're a city entity, so we're part of a uh, city government. And once the break-ins happened, the city actually decided, oh, well, we do have the money to do renovations, so we might as well go ahead and do them now, since everything's a massive disaster. And it actually hit the news, which of course, all of you know, is not good <laughs> to have break-ins on your news, in the news. Um, however, now with COVID-19, things have been halted on the project. So even though they've started moving forward, they've now been halted. Um, I think we finally convinced enough people that if it's not safe for people, it's not safe for objects because we're starting to get other people in the city on our side um, and talking about removing the objects, getting us temporary storage, that kind of thing. But of course, when we finally started getting moving, COVID-19 happened. So we'll have to see where it goes from there. So in our case, we like Melanie um, are under local government. We are an authority. So according to our bylaws and all that fun stuff, we are a political subdivision of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Don't ask me what that means. I still haven't figured that out after four and a half years, but um, we are a state agency. Um, so we have, we face a lot of similar challenges. And I think one of our particular challenges is the fact that our administrators and our governing body, they're politicians and they work in government. They don't necessarily have that background in museum studies or in collections care or anything like that. So when I try to go get funding, that's a bit of a challenge because they don't necessarily understand the bigger picture in terms of collections care and the importance of it. So they they understand the importance of collections, but I don't think that they really have an accurate understanding of all the back end work that needs to happen to make sure that those collections are being cared for appropriately. Um, so funding is a bit of an issue for us in terms of, you know, going to our, you know, governing body and saying, you know, we need such and such amount of money to replace our HVAC system um, or something like that. So that's been a bit of an uphill battle, um, but I think they're slowly coming around and, and understanding the importance of 
proper collections care and, and funneling some resources down to us. Another thing is just our building is a huge challenge in itself. And so one of the things that was so hard for me to kind of wrap my mind around when I started at this position was that this is never going to be a perfect storage situation. Um, so it was a bit of a tough pill to swallow, but once I stopped fighting the building and working with the limitation, oh, you wanna leave? Okay. Um, working with the limitations of the building, then I think things started to move a little bit in a more positive direction. Um, so those were just, again, some of the challenges working within the historic structure and keeping in mind that being on the National Registrar, things are listed and you know certain projects have to go through all of this red tape and go up through and be approved with you know the Department of, of Historical and Heritage Resources and things like that. So I don't get to make decisions in a vacuum. Um, there's a lot of other people involved in something simple like getting storage cases and things like that. So getting all those people on the same page and working together um, has been a bit a big challenge for us. Um, so kind of similar, um, I am also part of a city, however, we do have a foundation museum wants to do has to be done with um, additional certain funds via grants or funding from our board slash foundation. So with that in mind, funding has been one of our major issues the first few years. Um, the foundation actually spent a lot of their money paying off the debt for purchasing the building. Um, because of that, a lot of the improvements were really low cost, um, things that the staff could do, such as covering shelves for vent dust, um, sealing up doors with foam, um, just trying to do their best to keep it a clean environment, um, making sure that they could at least patrol the area, um, cut down a ramp in the back where transients were using the restroom. So little small things that would just make it so it was a little safer for collections um, but throughout this process they were really thinking about how can we make this building better um, now i think i mentioned it earlier the, the roof actually um, causing tons of issues before there would always be a few a little bit of leaks or two but in summer of 2017 right before i started the position um, the whole roof was actually leaking in the warehouse that you actually can see in the picture. Um, so when I started, that was actually completely covered in plastic. You can kind of look at the top of the shelves that there's rust. Um, so the rust was actually was coming down into the, onto the shelf, sometimes on artifacts, um, obviously creating a really bad environment. So that is actually what really motivated the funding for the, for the actual um, space. Um, so that is actually what has been helpful um, and kind of trying to get the momentum going from there um, it still is an ongoing issue because now we do have an HVAC but getting funding for the HVAC making sure that we can get our match with NEH which we luckily have a development officer who's very dedicated to that um, but that has been one of our main issues um, the other challenge is of course staff time um, staff don't really work over there regularly um, myself an archivist um, curator and a few other staff members maintenance um, technician. They're the ones who have access to the building. Um, my goal is always to at least be over there one day a week on a good week. Um, obviously that's not a lot of time to actually get a lot of things done. Um, so it's really just staff time and being able to be over there and being able to work on projects to make improvements. And this has also been aggravated by a lot of staff vacancies in the past few years. So a lot of key positions such as archivist, maintenance tech, our museum tech were actually vacant. So for a while, it was usually just me going over and checking on the building and doing work. Um, so again, funding and staff time are, are two major challenges as we work with the building. So I'd say my first um, challenge that I had to deal with <clears throat> was um, just wrapping my head around this disaster that had befallen our collection. Um, you know, I. Thankfully, I'd been to a lot of disaster uh, recovery trainings. Um, we have a great team in North Carolina, the Cultural Resources Emergency Support Team, CREST. And um, so, you know, I had a network that I was plugged into. I had people I could call. Um, and I participated in, in some things before, but it's different when it's your own collection. Um, and you're the one who has to deal with it, who has to come up with a plan. Um, 
like I said, thankfully we have this Crest group in North Carolina, so I was able to contact them. Um, they <clears throat> had a lot of um, ideas and um, resources for us and even came and spent a couple of days on site and um, helped us <clears throat> clean affected items. Um, also, let's see, um, we, had, we had access to two conservators through this group as well, um, Paige Myers and Jennifer French at the North Carolina Museum of History. And uh, they were extremely helpful, especially in triaging the items that were affected. So they were able to help us figure out, um, you know, which items really had, really had mold for one thing. Because um, that's another thing you don't really think about until you're there is that mold looks different on different types of materials. And um, we also suffer from the fact that uh, our collection is 50 some years old and they haven't always, people before me were not always um, careful about cleaning things when they came into the collection. So we have a lot of things that are just really dusty. And so you open a drawer and you're like, is that inactive mold or is it just really dirty? Hard to tell. So having some conservators come in and, um, and help us figure that out was really, really helpful. And then of course they had all, um, all the tips and, and resources to help us make sure we were doing things correctly. Um, because like I said, it had trainings in this before, but when you're actually working on your own collection, it, it's easy to second guess what you're doing and um, just not be sure if you're doing it right. And so to have somebody walk you through it, reassure you that, you know, you can do this, you can get through it was, um, was really helpful. And then of course, funding was another issue. Um, thankfully, we had most of the supplies that we needed in our disaster kits. Um, and Crest was able to help us with some other things like extra vacuums. <clears throat> but one of the things that we needed to do was um, freeze a couple hundred textiles. So we needed a freezer truck. And uh, Mary and our curator did find a local company that um, would rent us a freezer truck, but we didn't have, our, we didn't have money in the budget for that. Um, and we also needed some electrical work done <clears throat> to um, an outbuilding so that we could plug the freezer into um, this building and run it through that. So um, we had to finagle some things through the city with the facilities department and we thankfully got it all um, funded. But uh, you know, we also have to work through our city budget office, which is handling things for all the other departments and they don't necessarily know that something is urgent. Um, so we had to work a little bit too to um, get that through a little faster. That took some time and kind of some poking um, over a few days. And then the, the last challenge is still ongoing and that's just the long-term issues with our HVAC system. Um, it's, it's old, it's getting older. It's, um, it's just a problem in a lot of ways. And we're part of the city. Um, we do, <clears throat> we have a great facilities department, but they're pretty small considering the number of buildings that they have to take care of. And we're not the only building in the city that has um, an old HVAC system. So, you know, I, I don't see myself getting a new system when city hall needs one or the um, fire department headquarters needs one. That's just a hard sell to make. Um, so we're exploring, you know, other options. It's probably gonna have to be grant funded for us to, to do that. Um, okay, so our third question is, how have you advocated for the collection and uh, for a solution to this situation? Um, so my first attempt was just to use the basic logic of, if it's not safe for humans to be in there, we shouldn't store objects in there because even if we'll go into La La Land where it is okay for the objects, no one can access them. So there's, it just didn't, you know, that doesn't make sense. Um, but unfortunately that tactic didn't work, um, which baffled me for a while. Um, but I also found get as many allies as you can and don't think just collections people. One of the things that really helped us out was we got our volunteer coordinator to say, no, volunteers are not allowed in there. It is not safe. So whenever we had to move anything around or move things out, we had to rely on other staff. 
and no one wanted to go in there because it's not safe. Um, so that kind of started putting pressure higher up on, well, we're putting more of ourselves out there, which I think is terrible because, you know, you're putting volunteers out there doing that. And um, I fully supported my volunteer coordinator saying no to volunteers being in there. Um, but in a weird way, just find any allies you can and any angle you can. Now, we obviously had a worst case scenario happen where someone broke in and started moving things around and all that kind of thing. But um, one tip I've heard is even if the worst case scenario hasn't actually happened, find those worst case scenarios and push them to the people above you. Um, because if you say, this is a real life situation that happened to someone else. So like, if you have a transient population that you're at risk of having a hobo fight club, Email me, I will send you these pictures, I will send you the news article. There you go, there's a worst case scenario. <laughs> so um, just find those cases where things have gone poorly and what it cost to get it fixed. And that can sometimes scare people into being on your side. So I haven't tried that one because we had the real life situation actually happen. So, but that was one I was thinking of for a while. Um, in kind of piggybacking off of the previous question in terms of, you know, some of the challenges and your administration not necessarily being familiar with collections, um, one of the things that we have found really helpful is to bring in outside experts to make those same recommendations. So I might, you know, be telling my administration and advocating for, you know, and in this case, I might advocate for an offsite storage facility, but having somebody else come in, a, a conservator or collections people from other institutions come in and say, yes, this is a good idea. Um, having those outside opinions kind of back up your own suggestions and recommendations has been really helpful for us. So one of the first things that we did, and this happened prior to me coming on was, we worked with the National Park Service to have a historic structures report completed on our building. And that has been so tremendously helpful just in terms of understanding your facility and being able to, you know, on these facilities reports, put in as much detail as humanly possible. That historic structures report just went above and beyond in terms of giving us detail and things like that. But one of the positives was they gave us specific recommendations. Um, and so now we are able to bring those recommendations to our board of trustees or to our executive leadership and say, this was a recommendation from the historic structures report. It came from outsider organization. Um, and I found that those typically tend to have a little bit more weight within my organization. Um, and one of the recommendations from the historic structures report was to have some sort of collections assessment done. So we also went ahead and had a CAP report, a collections assessment for preservation done. And of course, then they gave us some more recommendations. Um, so I can't tell you how successful it's been in implementing some of those recommendations simply by having an outside organization be the one that voices that recommendation as opposed to me as an internal staff member. So that has been really, really helpful. Um, another thing that we did was simply Again, we, we tried to stop fighting the building and that's still difficult every day for me to just kind of realize that we're never going to be that perfect environment. Um, but we decided to move ahead and modify and adapt some of our existing protocols and procedures to better reflect our abilities and the limitations of our structure. So for example, we list in our collections management policy that everything within reason should be able to be stored in those cabinets in collection storage. And that means that we need to address some sort of size limitations in terms of artifacts that we can bring in. So we decided in our collections management policy to specifically say that we aren't accepting any sort of macro artifacts or things that, um, unless it's, you know, this perfect example of something, uh, we're going to really try to stay away from objects that are larger than our 
collection storage cases that we have in storage. And another thing, just going back to our location and being right on the Chesapeake Bay and, you know, being at risk of hurricanes and having a moat, um, you know, just, just keep raising that water level up in our institution is a challenge. So instead of having a set um, in our disaster plan, making sure everything is above 12 inches, we raise that up to 36 inches. So everything in our collection storage, if we know that a storm is coming, or even if we're just going to be getting a lot of rain, that we can lift everything above 36 inches. Um, so we are now working with our structure as opposed to trying to change our structure into something that fits our collections. So we've kind of taken a different approach in that we are thinking of our collections in terms of our structure instead of the other way around. Um, and that's been really helpful for us in advocating for our collections just a little bit more. Um, so for me, it's really been a lot of communication and relationship building um, with other staff members. Now I am lucky in the sense that I came in and we have a museum director, a curator who have been here for many, many years. Um, and because of that, they've really seen the offsite facility kind of from the mid nineties where there was no offsite facility and massive storage just constraints to nowadays kind of as we are looking at NEH. Um, and a lot of that has been through their support and kind of working with um, people in my position as the registrar, um, but also other staff members to kind of help, especially development, to kind of help make that happen. Um, with that in mind, though, another thing that is really hard still for kind of upper level um, admin to kind of continue to acknowledge just because we do have a small staff is just the amount of time it takes and the amount of planning um, to kind of execute things over at offsite. Um, I made the most progress when I was over there um, for a consistent period of time, kind of preparing for our accreditation and cleaning up from the roofing, um, roofing problems. However, now that we're kind of looking forward at our next project, um, it's really kind of getting staff time and kind of, you know, making sure that I have time to go over there and make progress to kind of prepare for the NEH grant, um, particularly as we are planning on doing some deaccessioning, but also there's a lot of artifacts to move. Um, there's no ductwork, no vent system, so all that will have to be in place. Um, there's also is just some building stabilizations that have to take place before then. Um, so just making sure that I advocate and by, you know, making sure that we all know these are the deadlines that we have to meet. And again, they are fantastic and very supportive. Um, and luckily, you know, between all of us, we're kind of working to make that happen. Um, but that's been kind of an ongoing thing that I'm needing to advocate for, um, particularly meeting all those project goals. Another way that I've worked to advocate for the building has been just communication and relationship building with other staff members. Um, I know as collections people, you know, you always want to first offer line the other collections people to kind of work on the building. But because of that, you know, you need to also make sure, you know, is your maintenance tech, um, make sure he's on board with the building and that you know that you feel comfortable being able to go to him um, and that you know both um, that he's a resource, but also um, as I am in a city, we have other maintenance kind of support staff. So knowing who I can go to when there's a problem, but also making sure there's other people um, to, you know, work with me to make sure that there's eyes on the building. So our customer service, archivists, um, everyone really kind of works to make sure the offsite's safe. Um, so it's a lot of just kind of that ongoing, just advocating like, hey, our offsite facility's here. Um, we're excited for all these great improvements, but that we all kind of need to work together um, to make it happen. So uh, like Caitlin, I think working as a team really helped um, get us through the whole mold situation. Um, I kind of focused on getting a plan for um, triaging items that might have been affected, cleaning um, <clears throat> and data tracking throughout the project and then also afterwards because we want to be able to um, you know go back and check things that have been cleaned, make sure they're not showing any more signs of mold. <clears throat> and then our curator, uh, Marion, she really focused more on um, the logistics, so things like getting the freezer truck in place, um, helping advocate through, um, you know, our administrative systems, the many layers, 
um, in the city. And um, we also had a kind of a third team member who was um, not actually a staff member, but he's the contractor who works on our HVAC system. And he'd been working on the system for several years at this point, and he knew it really well. He had already been pushing for um, changes and, and upgrades and parts to be replaced. And so he already had a lot of ideas and suggestions and um, you know, was, was on board with us as far as getting things fixed and getting things um, in a better place. So um, he's been helpful to us, you know, kind of in the long term as we're continuing to deal with things. Um, it also was really helpful that we had data going back um, over 10 years, 13, 14 years, something like that, that we had been um, collecting environmental data in the building. So we were able to pull up that and point to you know, trends over time and show that this is not just a one-time kind of thing. We need to plan for the next time this happens, um, which it did happen again. Um, but by that time, thankfully, we had um, an industrial dehumidifier on, on site that um, our facilities department bought for us. Uh, we didn't actually end up even having to turn it on though because it was a better time of year and um, a much shorter out outage also, which was fantastic. Um, also, like Melanie mentioned, the sort of scare tactic of, um, you know, sometimes it, it's, it takes a disaster or a big event for people to pay attention and um, mold on our community's history was, um, was kind of a scary thing. Nobody wants that to happen on their watch. And so I think that um, helped a little bit in get show, giving an urgency to the situation and needing to do something quickly. Um, we've also worked on finding outside money, like I mentioned. Uh, we're working through <clears throat> an NEH planning grant right now to um, collect some more detailed environmental data and try some um, different things with our system to see if we can get it working a little better. And um, then in the future, we might go for a bigger grant to um, replace some parts of the system. But um, ongoing, you know, now it's been three years since that um, <clears throat> first HVAC outage, air conditioning outage. And so, um, you know, it's, it's kind of behind us now as far as like the mold has been cleaned up. We've um, <clears throat> got some things in place. You know, we've made some minor changes to our um, HVAC system that have helped. Um, but, you know, the overall issue is still there. And so we're still um, kind of having to be that squeaky wheel and just keep up on, on things and make sure that, you know, filters are being replaced and all those things that um, are just general maintenance and constantly keeping track of what the, um, <clears throat> what the system is doing so that we can hopefully catch um, any future outages pretty quickly. So our last question um, is, how has the situation impacted your mental health? And have you found any strategies that have helped with that? So it has been very difficult mentally, especially when trying to first bring up the fact that, you know, if people shouldn't be in there, then artifacts shouldn't be, and people didn't seem to comprehend that. That was really difficult. Um, I have found a few tips. Um, I um, was suggested to read this book called um, Managing Previously Unmanaged Collections. And um, I found one of the best tips that it gives you just as a whole in dealing with not even just major situations, even minor situations like backlog. Um, focus on what you can do to better improve the situation rather than dwelling on how you got there and why. Um, I'm a big why person, so I would just dive down this rabbit hole of trying to figure out how we ended up the way we were and why. And even now, like when the city is like, oh, we have money to do it. I'm like, why didn't we do it earlier? But I need to just mentally divide that off and just be like, okay, this is where we are. The reason we're here is out of my control. So where do we go from there? And then another thing I've been working on is instead of focusing on where you should be, 
focus on the little steps that have been taken and, you know, reward yourself accordingly. Like if it's a minor step, don't go out and, you know, have a humongous party or anything like that. But like, do pep yourself up, just give yourself a pat on the back um, for taking any step. Cause sometimes just a tiny step is immensely more difficult than it should be. But again, that's the, don't focus on where you should be, focus on what you've done to improve the situation. I agree with Melanie. Um, I'm a big list person. Lists are my life. Uh, I have lists upon lists and they tell me to consult other lists. Um, and so one of the things that I needed to do was to kind of switch my thinking. And I knew I was never not going to make a list, but the content of that, um, if I changed my thought process, I found that to be really helpful. So instead of making, you know, lists and progress charts and things like that on what I still had left to accomplish, if I could just reframe that and make lists of all the things I'd already done. Um, I thought that that turned out to be really helpful for me because if I was having, you know, a rough day and, you know, I, I wasn't as productive as I wanted to be and didn't get through, you know, A, B, and C on my list of things to do, you know, that, that kind of took a mental toll, toll on me and I was disappointed and, you know, as much as I would love to be superwoman at my institution, I'm not, I'm, I'm just human. Um, so having that list of things I'd already accomplished was really a positive for me. And so I could go back and be like, look at how far you've already come. Don't focus on how much further you have left to go. Um, and, and go ahead and, you know, celebrate those little victories. I, you know, had a little dance party in my office for about five minutes when I got new shelves in my collection storage. Um, little things like that. Celebrate those and, and be proud of yourself for any progress that you're making because it's more than was made before you were there. Um, and another thing was we can kind of go down the rabbit hole with some of these projects. And so really taking time to maintain that work-life balance has been really challenging. And then once I kind of got the hang of it, um, it's been really rewarding. So I know that that's a little bit, oh, speaking for myself, um, that's been a little bit more difficult in terms of our current situation because I feel like I'm always working now. Um, so really setting those boundaries for myself and having that work-life balance and saying, you know, I'm not going to work anymore after 7 p.m. Um, while I'm home um, has really helped me maintain just a positive outlook on, on everything. Um, and so there are some comments going back and forth about the shelves that I put in. Um, we're not talking like compact shelving or anything super impressive like that. They're literally just like clip in shelves on to like a wardrobe cabinet. But um, that was a big deal for me. That was, <laughs> that was um, a simple things like that were a challenge in working through um, the approval process and things like that. So even something simple like that. Um, I gave myself a little dance party. I took five minutes and just, you know, kind of had fun in my office. And I'm sure my coworkers probably thought I was a little crazy going on, but, um, you know, once I told them what it was about and then they joined in and, uh, you know, maybe one day I'll get them to join in on the dance party too next time. So, um, but yeah, maintaining those work-life balances um, and just celebrating those things, put everything in perspective and, and keep, keep us all positive moving forward with these challenges that we're facing. Um, kind of concern of the stress and just the amount of work that you have that needs to be done, just kind of, again, the ongoing lack of time. Um, I always feel guilty that I'm not spending enough time to over there as much as I need. Um, but really for me, it's been trying to set realistic goals and expectations for myself. Um, you know, I, one day a week has been kind of my first key was going over there one day a week and then kind of increasing it to more days a week and kind of being able to see my actual progress, um, but also working and kind of making sure that I can continue to rely on the support that I have. I am very lucky that I have um, members of staff who are able to help me and work with me, um, but also that we have um, work studies 
that can kind of help me and, you know, just having those other people and knowing that I'm not alone has been very helpful. Um, but also, again, being able to delegate to those people has been able to reduce some of that stress. So having the support, seeing the support in my organization, delegating, and also just collaborating with others has been extremely helpful for me. Um, but again, you know, not only just trying to think forward and think, you know, I have this, all these projects that still need to be done, but also looking at what myself and my predecessors were able to accomplish, um, and just really be able to kind of keep my eye on, you know, the accomplishments accomplishments we've made, um, but also the potential for the future, um, and try to use that as a way to um, just, you know, help me mentally as a, a cheer, cheering on myself, but also the whole organization. So just to kind of reiterate what everyone else has said, um, it is, it's hard, it can be depressing and um, exhausting to deal with these sorts of situations, uh, especially the ones that are kind of ongoing and may not feel like they're gonna resolve anytime soon. Um, and I think you know, part of it is that as collections professionals, we, um, we kind of talk about ourselves, we see ourselves as the protectors of our collection, as their advocates. And so when something happens to that collection, even if it's not anything that you did personally, it still feels very personal and it can feel like you've failed and you have um, have not done your job properly. Um, so, you know, we put a lot of responsibility on ourselves and that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, we have um, very important objects and stories that we, we hold in our collections. But, um, you know, we need to acknowledge that and remember um, that, you know, we're not doing this alone. Um, and that it's not a bad thing to admit that things are difficult. Um, part of what was really helpful for me was actually just admitting how hard it was to um, a group of colleagues, uh, the Crest Group in North Carolina that I mentioned. It, um, it felt really good just to get that off my chest and say, you know, this has been really hard and it's been great to have all of your, your health and expertise, but um, you know, you still end up carrying a lot of it on yourself. And um, so, you know, it's not necessarily an easy um, thing to, to fix or change, but I think if we can talk about these things um, and, you know, help each other know that we're not alone, we're all dealing with, <clears throat> with issues and, and things that are difficult. Um, but, you know, part of that is just working in collections. Um, you're rarely gonna have a perfect or ideal situation. Um, so that is all our questions that we have. Um, so we're gonna open it up to questions from you. Um, I don't know if Caitlin wants to uh, let us know. Caitlin POTUS, let yeah. us know if she's heard any <laughs> yeah. questions. So we had a couple of questions come through in the Q&A. Um, Ted Greenberg's asking for municipal museums, if collections are owned by the city, or county, can you not use that as ammunition to get funding? Um, the city or county could be held liable for mismanagement of collections and raise insurance premiums if claims are made. Have any of you experienced anything like that? I'll go ahead and say something. It was before my time, but the problem with the idea of collections being owned by the city is higher ups in the city don't always view it as a responsibility, but more of as a resource. Um, it was before my time, but there was talks of, from some people who were around, they were saying the city was wanting to sell things to make money. Um, so I would be, I mean, that's a good idea, but I would be hesitant um, without a lot of education of higher ups on how that works. I'm actually hesitant to remind the city that they have responsibility for these and fear that they might go, well, we can just sell them and make money off of it. So for my um, institution, we're actually, we're a city museum, but we have a nonprofit historical society that owns the collection. So <clears throat> it's a, sort of a weird situation in some ways, um, but it does help 
in many cases because a lot of times for collections funding and, and um, supplies and things, I don't have to go through the city and the purchasing process and all that. I can go through the historical society, which makes some things easier. Um, <clears throat> but it's complicated because the city still owns the building. They own the spaces that the objects are stored in and, um, and exhibited in. So there's like a weird line there between, you know, when does it become the city's responsibility versus the historical society's responsibility. And um, for our mold situation, it kind of worked out as a, a partnership in a sense. The historical society <clears throat> already had a lot of supplies on hand. Um, and then some of the bigger um, funding issues were, were taken through the city and our grant is through the city. Mine's kind of an interesting situation because while the collections are the city's, the foundation who actually still owns the collections building. Um, so it's really strange because the sit museum is a city entity. The collections are the city's. Um, we have insurance on the collection through the city, but the building where the offsite collections are stored is actually in the foundation. Um, so that's been kind of a weird, strange thing because it's like, it is our building, but it's not our building. Um, but did, we do get the support in the city in terms of maintenance and sort of the facility help for that building, but it's kind of a, a strange situation. Um, our city also does own an outdoor sculpture collection, which I'm also in, in charge of, but that has actually helped kind of raise the awareness of damage to the collections a little bit, um, just because we had to have some insurance policies for vandalism to those collection items. So I do think it kind of helps in the sense that it made um, the entire city um, government, especially the insurance individuals, a little more aware of kind of the overall collections and their value. Great. Chelsea, did you have anything to add? Um, so ours are kind of owned by the state because we are that political subdivision of the Commonwealth for whatever that means. Um, you'd think after four and a half years, I would have figured it out. But now I just realized that that's kind of the elevator pitch I need to use. Um, so the state owns our collection, um, but we do you know, try to use our foundation and things like that for the support that we need. Um, so we have the Casement Museum Foundation, and then we also have the Fort Monroe Authority Foundation. Um, so going through the foundations actually has been a little bit easier in terms of, of helping us with those supplies and things like that. Um, in terms of timeline and getting some of those things, um, sometimes it's easier to just go through the foundation. Great. So there's another question kind of along the same lines, but um, have any of you enlisted the support of your insurance carrier to get collection support? We no. have not, um, but that's a really good idea. <laughs> I'm gonna jot that down. Um, so I think that um, reaching out to them might be one of those outside um, organizations that could make some recommendations in addition to those found in our historic structures report and in our collections assessment report. Um, again, just having some of those outside organizations, um, those subject matter experts that might be able to, to recommend some things and, and help move some projects forward. Great. Um, so, I know a couple of you mentioned getting a couple of grants, um, the NEH grant, but Catherine Sullivan asked, would it be best to do a CAP grant prior to an NEH grant? It couldn't hurt, for sure. Um, I think any <clears throat> anything you're able to point to that shows, um, you know, we have uh, we've already done other other things, other steps to um, identify issues. Um, if you have had a CAP grant and you have addressed some of those um, things that were identified in the report, uh, I think that will help also when you're applying for an NEH grant. Uh, I don't think it's necessary, but it certainly is helpful. It's one more um, piece of evidence you can show for the importance of your project. Great. Um, well, we're nearing the end of our hour, so unless anybody else has something to add or another question to address, 
um, I think we'll sign off. Is any, any last words from our presenters? Thanks everyone for being here. Um, <clears throat> it was a lot of fun. And um, like I said before, feel free to email me. Also, if you have any other questions or want to talk about mold, <laughs> I can talk about it for a long time. Yeah, thanks for um, chiming in and giving us the opportunity to present this session to you guys. It's been really great. Um, I know we kind of mentioned some very extreme circumstances that we're all dealing with, but I hope that, you know, some of our, our solutions and tips might be beneficial to anybody um, in any sort of museum situation. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for joining us and we look forward to seeing you at our next collection stewardship session tomorrow at noon Pacific and three o'clock Eastern. Have a great day.